And now I'd like to uh, announce or introduce our leadoff hitter. It's World Series time, and so we have someone who's leading off, our 20th Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, Mark Welch. Of course, as the Chief of Staff, he serves as part of the Joint Chiefs, giving advice to the Secretary of Defense and to the President. General Welch, since he's become the Chief, has had to stay laser-focused on the issues of the budget and how do you balance the ever-increasing demand for air power with the limited amount of dollars for the budget. And I know he appreciates you air mobility warriors because he said on the record, our mobility machine is awesome. And so I know he's really one of us in his heart. And I know that even further because I checked on his Facebook page. And right now, he has a cover page photo of a C-130J landing on the ice. Now, I don't think you would have done that just for us tonight. I know you did that because you wanted to keep them close. By the way, one more thing I noticed. He had 28,000 likes on his Facebook page for that photo. I think we can get you over to 30,000, Chief. And so I'm asking each one of you, if you get a chance, go on Facebook and like the Chief's page. We got to keep him happy and we got to keep him liking Air Mobility Command. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, General Mark Welsh. Thank you, sir. Hey, have appreciate fun. it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Thanks, General Light. It's great to be here with Mobility Majesty, past, present, and future. It's always good to see you. I'd like to go back to one person who was introduced before, Chief Gamble. Would you stand up for just a second? This lady is retiring after a remarkable career in our Air Force and contributions not just to the mobility community, but to airmen, to families, to the Air Force in general, and to the nation. And I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of all the rest of the Air Force Chief for leading us for a long, long time very, very well. Congratulations and best of luck to you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Um, you know, I was kind of blown away by the, by the intricate movements of the honor guard there. What you may not know, as we were walking in, General Light was telling me that they'd asked him to participate in the presentation of the colors, but after the first practice, he was a little worried he might tear a hamstring or <laughs> pop an Achilles or a groin muscle or something. So. <laughs> So thank you, sir, for not putting us through that. <laughs> it is really a thrill to be here, folks. This group literally could have held a convention anywhere on Earth. Uh, but thank you so much for deciding to do it someplace where it's 25 degrees warmer than Washington today. There really is something to be said for salting your margarita and not your sidewalk. <laughs> My wife, Betty, couldn't be here, and she has a lot of friends sitting in this audience. Betty usually uh, comes with me to events like this because she loves to see you, but she wanted me to say hi. Thanks for everything you're doing for her for us. She's working pretty hard in Washington this week, so I had to leave her behind, which is not making her happy because she is the sun seeker in the, in the family. The great part about being here is I get to see a whole lot of airmen who are on their first trip to ATA. I thought that was a phenomenal number, and it's a phenomenally good thing. Next slide, please. I was trying to decide what to talk about when I asked to first see the theme that you had for the conference. And I want to compliment you, the entire ETA team, for this particular theme, this excellence in action, past, present, and future, because I think it actually makes you think about an awful lot of things. But as I was trying to decide what to talk to you about tonight, I got this picture attached to an email that was sent to me in my office. And I realized that uh, this is a pretty incredible picture, actually. And I started to think about the air refueling community specifically, the General Light just mentioned, kind of the, the add-on to the family here after a, 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 the Airlift Association, be, Association began. And I realized that when you talk about excellence in action, you're talking about this community. Think about the gazillions of gallons of fuel that's been offloaded by the, our great air refueling teams. Think about the bazillions of deployments they've supported to combat and elsewhere. Think about the humanitarian relief operations that they have enabled. 
It is absolutely incredible what they've done over time. So that excellence in action really kind of is visible in this picture. And so is the past, the present, and the future. Right in the middle is the future. It's a pretty amazing picture. You've got the KC-10, you've got the new KC-46, and then about 60 years of the past is also captured in that KC-135 in the background. But someone had told me once that we've been doing air refueling for 93 years almost. And I started doing the math and went, well, what happened before the KC-135? I'd heard of the question mark. I knew that was in 1929, but that's all I'd ever heard of. So I kind of got interested in who was it who first came up with the idea of putting a gas station in the air? Who had the courage to try it? Now, most of you are smarter than I am about this, so you probably already know these things, but for you new folks, you might not. So let me take you for a very short walk down memory lane, and then we'll talk about anything you want. Next slide, please. I just realized, looking up at the screen, that HD is not my friend. <laughs> so I'll apologize <laughs> right now to all of you for, the, for, the, for that. You know, we've had the IDEA program in the Air Force for a long time. Now we have uh, every dollar counts. Every dollar counts. Anybody can submit a great idea they want somebody to try. They must have had an IDEA program back in the organization <laughs> that this guy came out of. Looking back on it, it might not have been a great idea, but it had some merit in 1920. This guy, who I'll call short straw, because I'm pretty confident that's what he drew, <laughs> is standing on the back of a Ford Model T as that Boeing monoplane comes running up the runway behind him. This was a, actually a mail pilot, and they were trying to figure out ways to speed up the process. And if the mail guy didn't have to stop at every little airport to get gas, if they could just fly by, pick up some gas on their route, they could make their timing a little bit better, especially as weather delayed them somewhere else in their route. So you got that Boeing monoplane, which flew about 160, racing up the runway, and you got the Model T with short straw hanging on the back with a, a can of gas, handing it up to the mailman. Uh, racing might be the wrong term. Uh, remember the term zero to 60 hadn't been invented yet in 1920, because that Model T could go from zero to 40 or so. But this wasn't real sexy looking, so airmen weren't attracted. It didn't look nearly cool enough for cutting edge in technology. And so something new had to come along. And about a year later, it did. Next slide. This looks cooler. <laughs> Old Wesley May there decided that he would take off in his buddy Frank's Lincoln Standard biplane. As they climbed to altitude, he strapped on a five-gallon fuel tank, climbed out of the cockpit, up on the wing, walked over to the end, jumped on the <laughs> side of Earl's Curtis Ginny airplane, and did a, tried to do a pull-up on the wing there. Well, what he realized for the first time at exactly this moment is that that five gallons of fuel adds about 30 pounds to your body weight. And as he struggled to get up on the wing, he remembered thinking, um, this might not have been as good an idea as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> but he did manage to make it up onto Earl's airplane. He walked up the wing, and he dumped the gas into the fuel tank. Now, the Army Air Corps was aware of this. They, some of them saw it, but they thought, you know, this is a stunt for air shows. This is not really a valid mission capability, and so they kind of ignored this. Next slide. By the way, we thought about back then bringing air refueling in, but if that was the only technique, there was no way we were going to do it because we just weren't interested in adding pull-ups to the PT test. <laughs> <laughs> but a couple of years later, the Army Air Corps got interested, and four young company grade officers Frank and Virgil were two of them here. These guys were the tanker pilots, our first tanker pilots in the Army Air Corps, and by extension, the United States Air Force. They were flying at a Haviland DH-4B with a 50-foot rubber hose connected to a specially fitted fuel tank. Next slide. The receivers were old Lowell and John. They were also flying a DH-4B. Next slide. The technique was pretty straightforward. You throw that 50-foot hose out one airplane and you catch it with the other one. You plug it into your fuel tank and you offload gas at 500 feet AGL. And they did it. They offloaded 75 gallons of fuel through that 50 foot rubber hose. Pretty amazing. Air refueling was born in the United States military. But for some reason it wasn't really attractive. Nobody thought of any good mission use for it and so it just kind of disappeared as an idea for a while. Next slide. But five years later in Belgium, a couple of Belgian Air Force guys got an idea that they should try it. Now, I'm not real sure why. 
I mean, they got a whole lot of stuff in Belgium. They've got a really long and rich aviation heritage there, and they can cram an awful lot of chocolate and waffles and mussels and beer into their country. But why they were interested in air refueling, I don't know. But two airmen actually did get airborne, and they passed fuel back and forth between airplanes for 60 hours in 1928. Pretty astonishing. The most significant thing about that event, though, is they got the attention of people back in the States in the Army Air Corps. Next slide, please. People like Carl Spotts on the left, Ira Aker standing next to him, Lieutenants Halverson, Harry Halverson, and Lieutenant Pete Casada, and Staff Sergeant Roy Huey. These guys got the idea of trying something different, and on January 1st of 1929, they did. Next slide. Fly in the question mark, which almost all of you have heard of. The question mark, by the way, was named after a question. How long can a Ford Trimotor fly? That's where the question mark came from. The answer was a little over 150 hours. Pretty amazing accomplishment in those days. By the way, can we back up one slide? Uh, the other way, backwards. There you go, thank you. This is pretty sweet gear, isn't it? <laughs> That's a lot of leather, really cool gloves. I'm thinking that we should, you know, have a new uniform. <laughs> I get Dewey Everhart to test, test wear this stuff. <laughs> Excuse me, I digress. Next slide. <laughs> and one more, please. Thank you. 150 hours sounded like an awful lot of time, didn't it? Well, these guys, good old Fred and Al Key, decided that they were going to try and do the same thing. And they stayed airborne for 27 days in 1935, flying a Curtis Robin that's sitting right there behind them. 27 days. And one of the things that became real clear to me as I was reading about this early refueling mission was that the people who actually received the gas all became famous. The people who passed the gas, not so much. Sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> Let me show you your heritage. Next slide. These were the guys who passed the gas to the Key Brothers. Jim and Bill. 484 hookups during those 27 days. 113 sorties. Each of them piled into their own single-seat tanker. Pretty incredible history. Next slide. But the Air Corps still hadn't gotten back into air refueling until the early 1940s now, where they experimented with great success refueling bomber to bomber. I'd never heard of this before. Pretty awesome. Started with B-17s, refueling B-24s. They worked the other way around. They did it same type to same type. Really had some great success with it. Never really used it operationally in any big way. But the thought was there now. Next slide. And eventually, in the early 50s, someone decided that it was time to have a tanker fleet, like a real fleet. And the first real effort was modifying a Boeing B-29 super, super Fortress into the old KB-50D, designed and, and renovated by Boeing Company. And it became our first real fleet type of tanker, shown here doing its first tri-point refueling ever with three F-100 Super Sabres. Next slide. Pretty soon, everybody wanted to be in on the action. Here's a KB-50 with an F-101, an F-100, and a B-66 destroyer taking gas simultaneously. And now we were hooked. At about the same time, the first really custom-designed, focused, purpose-built airplane, the KC-135, started rolling off the assembly line. Next slide. Number 732 was delivered in 1965. And here's a KC-135 dragging eight F-105s north before they hit their drop-off point to head into North Vietnam. This is the airplane that changed the game. It's still playing the game. Next slide. Later in 1965, General Curtis LeMay, who had overseen much of this development while he was the commander of SAC and then the Air Force Chief of Staff, retired. He was given a picture much like the one on the left, which is a KC-135 refueling a B-52 in 1965. Next slide. Uh, 
Some things haven't changed a lot. <laughs> but I'll tell you, although I'm not as accomplished, as talented, or as smart as General LeMay, I do appear to be happier. <laughs> I don't know if those are the same tail numbers, but they could be. <laughs> Next slide. I'll tell you what is different about our air refueling fleet today versus the air refueling fleet that General LeMay was privileged to lead. His was preparing for combat. Our air refuelers today are battle-tested, battle-proven, battle-hardened. In 1991, they made an air campaign possible that would never have been possible at any time before in history. Every strike sortie flown was refueled, except the ones up in the forward area doing close air support. Everything that went into Kuwait and extended on extended missions or into Iraq. My squadron was an F-16 squadron. We deployed from Hill to the east coast of the U.S. We took off the next day and flew 15 and a half hours into a base in the UAE. I wonder how we did that. We averaged eight and a half hour sorties for the entirety of the war. My longest sortie was almost 13 hours. How do you do that in an F-16? Everybody who flew will tell you that the tankers were the key to success. It's an incredible legacy. Next slide. Continued in the Balkans. It enabled continuous presence over combat zones that we would never have been able to monitor 24 hours a day. Next slide. 2001, Operation Enduring Freedom began, and we flew to the other side of the world and flew tankers out of bases we'd never heard of before, around the perimeter of Afghanistan, over the Persian Gulf, crossing through corridors in foreign countries arranged by people who do clearances for this command and its people. And with a very small ground force, we conducted an air campaign that routed the Taliban. Never, ever would have happened without our refueling fleet. No way it could have happened. Next slide. For the next eight years, we continued in OAF as it began, OIF, and continued through that effort and the follow-up activity. Everything that was accomplished was accomplished on the back of our refueling fleet. Next slide. Took the roadshow to Libya in 2011. An incredible total force tanker team enabled both U.S. and coalition operations throughout Odyssey Dawn and then Enduring Freedom. Next slide. Today, that fleet is still enabling combat operations. Everything we do in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, and everywhere else in the world in terms of air activity is enabled by the refueling fleet that you represent. This is an F-22 on the night it was first flown into combat. Last thing they saw before they headed across the border was a boom operator. Next slide. And now we've got airmen turned test pilots like Ron Johnson and great AMC airmen and AFMC airmen who've been picked to pilot and maintain the test program for our new wing stallion. Next slide. And just over a month ago, 25th of September of this year, Pegasus crested 35,000 feet, dropped its boom, and started its legacy. It's an exciting time. Next slide. What's next? I don't know. <laughs> Interstellar mobility? Someday it'll happen. And you guys will be the ones who figure out how to do it. Because all these airframes are cool, all the technology is cool, all the ideas are cool, but every one of them had an airman who was willing to try it, who adjusted it, who made it work, who turned it into combat capability. And those airmen are sitting right here in this auditorium with different names and younger faces. You guys have no idea how cool you are. The reason I love coming here isn't because I consider the mobility force part of the Air Force. The reason is because I'm jealous. I'm the son of an old airlifter from World War II who became a fighter pilot. But the only museum I ever went with him to see was one that had gliders and goonie birds in it because that's what he wanted to go see. He wasn't prouder of anything in his life than he was of his time resupplying Patton's Third Army in a breakout across France, doing airdrop that probably hit somewhere in a county, and they call that good. <laughs> Man, would he be impressed by what you're doing today. And who knows what you're going to be doing in the future. I can't wait to see it. I'll tell you something else about it, though. Next slide. This community has figured it out. 
you figured it out that everybody has a part in it. It's not about the people flying the airplanes only. It's not about the people loading pallets. It's not about the people planning missions. It's not about the people up here at the front of the room. It's about everybody who contributes. We put together a video a couple of years ago. It started with me talking to a great airlift pilot named John Berger. Some of you probably know John, C-17 pilot, who at that time had the great misfortune of being my speechwriter. And I said, hey, John, I got this great idea. I want to show how everybody connects to the Air Force mission. Uh, give me a plan. So John went away and he came back with this thing scratched on a piece of paper. You don't have to be able to read any of this. I will tell you, though, since it is the Airlift Tanker Association, that the whole top row is airlift stuff. <laughs> Aerial port, inner theater C-130, C-5s. I mean, it's, the whole thing is about airlift. Right in the middle is industry. And this is how all the things start with a bomb on target on the left side of the chart and everything that goes back through the airplane, the pilot, the air crew, the everybody, training, education, the whole thing, and how it flows to an end game. And he handed this over to a great combat camera squadron and said, hey, make a video. <laughs> Give me a movie of that. <laughs> Some of you may have seen it, the rest of you are about to. Can we go to the next slide and run this video, please? Let me finish by telling you that you guys capture that video perfectly in the way you do business, and it's inspirational to everybody else to watch. Thanks for who you are. I'll tell you, as Chief of Staff of the most capable Air Force on the planet, I find plenty of things to lose sleep about. Global mobility is not one of them. I've had the opportunity to sit in meeting after meeting in the Pentagon, in the tank with the Joint Chiefs, with the Secretary of Defense, sometimes even at the White House, where we've talked about what we should send where to respond to a humanitarian situation, to a new emerging contingency, to a crisis, to a combat operation. We've talked about Patriot batteries going to here and brigade combat teams going to there and fighter or bomber squadrons going over here. Never once in all those meetings, not a single time, has anyone ever asked, can we get it there? Never. That is an unbelievable compliment to the men and women in this room. So on behalf of my family, on behalf of everybody who serves in our Air Force, on behalf of the men and women who serve in all our armed forces, thank you for making sure that everything we play is an away game. That's your legacy. You should be awfully proud of it.